Haggai 2, uh, verses 3 through 9. Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Who cares what the church looks like if Jesus is with us? Really? According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts once more, it is a little while and I will shake the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine says the Lord of hosts, the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Who is left among you that had not seen this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? I want to preach from the subject, blinded by the past. Let's ask the blessing of the Lord upon his word. We thank you, precious Jesus, for the power of your word. We pray that the hand of God would minister greatly in this service today, and that every one of us could have revelation and grasp the power that is present in this house today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Turn to someone and smile at them. Shake their hand if they look friendly. You may be seated. How do you see it? The past can become a prison that colors everything that we experience in life. Some months ago, you remember the story of the uh, folks that paid, seems like it was hundreds of thousands of dollars to go down in a questionable um, submarine to go down and to go down and go backwards in time over a century to experience firsthand the wreckage of the sunken Titanic on the Atlantic floor. People's, uh, I don't know, fascination with the past can sometimes get the better of their good judgment. Why would I want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and risk my life to see a glorified tin can resting away on the ocean floor when you could just send a camera down there and I could boot it up on YouTube? I guess you can't brag to your buddies back home if you saw it on YouTube like you can if you actually experienced the dangers of going down, in this case, and experiencing the past frozen in time. It's easy to become blinded by the past. 
There is a conflict in the Middle East right now that is placing world governments on a knife edge of possible World War III. And it all is because of something that happened in the past. What they call the Gaza Strip really is the area that was the, uh, was the precinct of the five principal Philistinian cities. You know, when the Ark of the Covenant was stolen in battle and taken to Ashdod, that's where Ashdod was. And when the Ark was placed in the temple of Dagon and the Lord had to defeat, had to go like they say, mano a mano, with the demon throng in the night all by himself. I know we think God needs us so badly, and, and he does in a lot of ways, but if you're not there, he'll still come through, if, if coming through needs to happen, praise God. And you know how that Dagon was overthrown. Anyway, it is the land of the Philistines. It is the land of of, uh, of the giants. It is the land that uh, has had centuries, millennia long conflict with the Jewish people. And so because of unsettled scores from the past, there's problems to this day. But I can't... Uh, I don't have a solution. No one has yet had a solution. I guess the Antichrist is going to come with some kind of a solution. So I'm not going to have one, praise God. Lest anybody misunderstand my identity. And if you have one, I suggest you keep it to yourself for a while. But... Uh, but the children of Israel here are now presented with the second construction of the temple after it had been sacked and destroyed by the Babylonians. I don't know, was it 536, 586 B.C.? They came in and wiped it out. And then, of course, Cyrus uh, gave the order to permit the children of Israel to go back and to rebuild the temple. And... Um, Circumstances under Zerubbabel and Nehemiah were much different than circumstances under Solomon. Solomon had, you know, moolah, so they say, you know. Solomon had the wherewithal to build something magnificent, breathtaking. Uh, but now the remnants of the children of Israel were, were, were basically... Um, relying on a pagan king to fund their enterprise. So they had to scale things back. And even when it came to the building of the foundation of the second temple, it was already apparent that it wasn't going to be the same. And the Bible said the old men cried and the young men shouted. Isn't it funny how that the same church can have two different reactions in people depending on, I guess, depending on the lens, depending on whether the past has blinded you or made you grateful. Why did the young men shout? Because to have anything to call a house of worship after being raised in Babylonian captivity and seeing nothing but pagan enterprises on every street corner. Now they have something to glorify God with. <clears throat> I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, anything is better than nothing at all. And so they shouted that progress was being made. But then the former generation, some of the elders that had seen the temple in its former glory shook their head because the past had controlled their emotions so much that they couldn't get into the spirit of, uh, of, of rejoicing because they just somehow associated with greater glory with more of the same. Uh, let, me, let me say that again. They associated the greater glory with more of the same. We, we don't want less of 
what we had. We, we think we need more of what we had for something to be more glorious. Would, would to God that worry would work that way. How many's ever had a better feeling about worrying more about your problem? What do they say the definition of insanity is? Doing the same things over and over with greater intensity, expecting a different result? And so I want to bring to your understanding today that sometimes God wants to do a new thing. Praise God. So some of you just want more of what you already have. Hallelujah. Give me another shout down. Give me another trip around the aisle. And I'm not saying we need to stop doing that. Give me another tongue talking fit. Somebody said, don't you know your church has fits? Yeah, they're benefits, praise God. It is a benefit to praise the Lord, to speak with other tongues, to shout under the anointing, to express ourselves. But that's what, that, that stuff does stuff for me. But is there a possibility that there's something that lies beyond the realm of what I need God to do for me? Hello? Could it be that I don't want more, I don't need more of what I already have, but maybe I need a little bit of what I need? Ah, come on, I know what we want, but what if God stepped in this building to do something for us what if some of us needs to be extricated from the blinders of the past? What if God says you don't have to spend the rest of your life shouting over your pain, your heartbreak, the abuses that you've endured in your life? What if the Lord said, I'm coming in here to do something new. I'm going to take the blinders of the past off of you. I'm going to sever the tendrils of pain and sorrow that have attached you to moments that might have happened decades ago and set you free from spirits that have chained you emotionally to things that have happened to you. Oh my God, hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I, 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 so, sometimes you don't measure the glory by quantity. Amen. You measure it by quality. And so they saw a smaller temple and they thought less glory. But what if the smaller temple was only concentrating, oh hallelujah, the glory. Come on, who wants a computer the size of a garage? Go look at 2001, was that the uh, Odyssey uh, futuristic film where Hal the computer and they had computers the size of semi-trucks? And now uh, in your pocket or purse is a computer more powerful than the computers they used to put man on the moon in 1969. Who wants a computer that big when you can have a powerhouse that you can put in the palm of your hand? Oh, I'm after quality today. Oh, if somehow we could get a breakthrough of glory that could sever us uh, from these uh, blinders that hold us bound in Jesus' name. Amen. And so <clears throat> there are degrees of glory. When we behold the glory of the Lord, we're changed from glory to glory into the image of the Lord. It is possible this morning for the infrastructure to be smaller and the glory to be greater. Think of it this way. If we haven't, we, the prayer that we're supposed to pray is, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That sounds to me like an invasion. It sounds to me like our job is to pray for a celestial invasion. It, I see people fanning themselves. Maybe we could turn that air on over there. I don't want to lose you. I don't want you to faint because you're hot. I want you to faint under the anointing, but not because you're hot. But we're praying for heaven to come to earth. And so what is that like? That's like another dimension, amen, intruding into the world of familiarity that we know 
and have experience with. Think of it this way. When something from another dimension enters into the realm uh, of a lower dimension, it causes, it might, and probably should cause panic and fear at first. Take a fish casually enjoying the afternoon in the fishbowl. Plunge your finger into the water. And the next thing you know, there's tension in the tank. What's that? Now they sense something came into their world, but they have no idea what to make of it. You're from another plane. You're from another realm. And so the introduction of your hand, you may be coming in there to... I don't know, help it. Maybe it's sick. Maybe it's got something stuck on a fin and you want to help take it off. But it don't see you like that. It sees you like... And it runs for cover because when one dimension that is higher steps into a lower dimension, it often causes consternation and fear. Come on, remember when you first walked into a Pentecostal church? Remember when the hands went up in the air all at once? And you thought, what happened? Are we being held up? Here, I got two bucks. That's what I thought. What's going on here? Everybody's got their hands up at the same time. Well, what I soon would learn is that's what people do when the presence of God enters in, amen, to the to the realm of the human experience. There's a reaction. Now, it causes some to be afraid and head for the door. It causes others to be intrigued and head for the altar. I'm glad I'm preaching to people that headed for the altar when they encountered something supernatural in their midst. Praise the Lord. Let me say this. A little of something new is better than a truckload of something you're used to. I think it was the Chinese that created uh, gunpowder. And I think, I'm not sure if they were the first ones to use it for military purposes, but they used it for entertainment at least. You know, firecrackers, the age old big boy toy. Go down to South Carolina and buy them all year round, unless something's changed. But with, with sophistication, toys change. And so now 2.2 pounds of U-235, uranium-235, detonated, is equal to 17 tons of TNT. What did I say? Sometimes a little of something new is more powerful than a truckload of the same old, same old. Here's what the Holy Ghost told me. I'm not going to do anything new through you till you do something new for me. I'm not going to fl- allow you to compress me into your same old patterns. You're going to have to develop the courage and the determination and the willingness and the humility to step out of your own barriers that you have built to make yourself comfortable. When you do something you haven't done before, then I will do something I haven't done for you before. Information theory. You know, information theory works like this. The more of this world that a piece of information excludes, excludes, the more valuable it is. Let me give you uh, a, uh, well, a weak analogy because of my own limitations. You get a call from a scammer on the phone. I know none of you get those kinds of calls. If you don't have an area code somewhere, at least in North Carolina, I'm not answering your call unless I called you. 
you get a call from a scammer, they have at least two things. They have your phone number and uh, maybe your name, but they want more. Yeah, you could give them the, your birthday, your home address, your gender. They won't be satisfied. They want more. You can tell them where you bank, where you shop, what kind of car you drive. They want more. Well, my kids' names and ages are such and such, my favorite color, my profession, my spouse's name, my mother's maiden name. I want more. What do you want? They want nine numbers. And those nine numbers in the succession that you give to them exclude everybody else's nine numbers. If they can get those nine numbers, they got you where they want you. Hello? So in information theory, the more you exclude, the more powerful something is. Hallelujah. What am I trying to say? We bring so much baggage into the house of God. It's a wonder that God can even get through to us. Thank God for repentance. Thank God for the blood. Honestly, some of us got a crane and we dredge up from the blood every old pain and hurt. Every time it's time to have a breakthrough, the devil has you cranking up, amen, on cranes. All the pain and hurt when the Lord wants you to know, I forgave you and them of that a long time ago. You need to cut the cord that connects you to the past and you need to quit allowing yourself to be blinded by yesterday and open your eyes to see what the Lord can do in this moment for you. Ooh. Okay, I know it's mediocre up till now. Maybe it'll get better, maybe it won't. Let's see. Despise not the day of small things. The Lord said, you see this house? One day the desire of the nations is gonna step in here. And the glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former. And so John's prologue goes like this. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word, and the word was God. And in the 14th verse it says, and the word dwelt among us and became flesh, and we beheld his glory. And we beheld his glory. And the Lord said, the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, because the desire of the ages is going to show up. Oh, hallelujah. Don't despise the day of small things. Praise God, let me, let me say this. Two small doses of Jesus. Just two small doses of Jesus was enough to transcend the glory of a thousand years of temple worship. Two, he came to the temple twice. He came as a 12 year old and his parents were amazed because he was asking questions. And then again he came a week or so before his crucifixion, and he cleaned house. He turned the tables of the money changers over. And he told them, you've, you've taken the house of God and you've turned it into a den of thieves. Two small doses of Jesus, and this constitutes, oh, hear me now, the greater glory. Because this is when the desire of the ages came into those precincts physically, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now watch this. If Jesus can come as a 12-year-old asking questions, and that's glorious, more glorious than all of the glory the temple had experienced before, how much more glorious is when Jesus comes with the answers to the questions? I'm not 
preaching a Jesus who doesn't know what to do about your need. I'm preaching a Jesus who is the answer to your need. Oh my God. Oh, that's shouting material. Somebody ought to get it. I don't know. I wish my wife was here to tell me it was good. Watch this. And then again, so he came the second time. <laughs> I, I, let me see. This is what the Lord gave me. If Jesus in his infancy is more glorious than religion in its primacy, how much more glorious is Jesus when he's full grown? <laughs> and he's like Stephen's song. Hi. Rock pounding pop expiring. I see Jesus standing on the right hand of the glory of God. Oh, if Jesus as a 12 year old, as a boy, immature, undeveloped, not fully in his prime, how much more glorious is Jesus when he says, I ascend and I go to my God and your God, to my father and your father. Hey, how much more glorious is it when Jesus is sitting on the throne, amen, of the almighty God? Does anybody believe he's on the throne? If he's on the throne, then he has the power to rule in your favor. If he's on the throne, he's there to hear your case. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find help in the time of need. Second time he came, he came turning the tables. He came in judgment. And that was more glorious. That was a greater glory than any glory they had experienced in that temple heretofore. And so if Jesus come to church mad is more glorious, is a greater glory than anything they'd had before, somebody please tell me how much greater is the glory when he's glad. I'm not preaching to you a mad God today. I'm not preaching to you a frowning deity today. I'm not preaching to you a God that, that's looking down upon you and trying to sniff out all your troubles and make you feel ashamed of who you are. I'm preaching to you a father who's, 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 who's bending his neck to see over the horizon because there's a prodigal son heading home. And before you can even get home, he's going to meet you there. He's going to wrap his arms around you and he's going to start celebrating before the music starts, before the feast begins. Before the parties uh, attenders to show up, because he's celebrating a son or a daughter who was once dead but is now alive. If Jesus in judgment, two times he came once as a child, he came the other time as a judge. Both times it was more glorious. Oh, tell me now how great it is to be in the presence of God, <laughs> enjoying the worship and power of the Spirit, cleansed by the blood, filled with the promise of hope. Oh, hallelujah, what a God we serve. And so the glory of the latter can become greatly underestimated by uninspired minds. Don't be blinded by the past. I'm going to close on with the musicians to come. You ready for this? Faith doesn't work in reverse. We are not of them who draw back. Amen. But you know what the Holy Ghost is telling me? There are some that don't want to draw back, but they're being drawn back. By what? By Familiar spirits. The Israelites wanted what they were familiar with. But holding on to what we're familiar with can be a recipe for stagnation. Amen. 
We want it like it was before. We want it just like we remember. We want it. Our memories aren't too adequate anyway. When sometimes my wife and I will remember the same event and it's like, where were we living together back then? Your memory's not that great. Faith does not work in reverse. Faith is future focused. Familiar spirits work backwards. Why did they build a golden calf in the wilderness? Because they wanted something they were familiar with. Because Moses was gone and he was up to something new. And rather than to adventure into the unknown with Moses, they drew back to the familiarity of the golden calf and they reinstalled the religion that they had seen amongst the Egyptians. When they were pressed up against the Red Sea and the Egyptians are closing in and they're sandwiched in between two kinds of trouble, they can't go forward and they can't go backwards. What did they say to Moses? You brought us out here to die? We would rather have the garlic and the leeks and the onions of Egypt than to be out here dead? And now... Artificial intelligence is beginning to weave its sinister web around the minds and the imaginations of people all around the world. This is just the beginning, friends. It won't be long. They're already able to conjure up likenesses of dead relatives, take voice prints of their voice, go through their records, go through their life experiences, go through their writings, their letters, and they can give you somebody that's an avatar, that's a dead relative that you can talk to. This is how you know when something is evil, when it starts to mimic the very things that sorcerers and the wish of Endor and people that are involved in the occult have been practicing for ages. That's right. I don't wanna walk to talk to people who's dead. I wanna talk to one who was crucified, killed, buried, resurrected, and he's alive forevermore. Does anybody want to talk to Jesus? Why don't we stand right now and lift our hands? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Don't be pulled, don't be pulled, don't be pulled by pain. Don't be pulled by failure. Don't be pulled by brokenness. Don't be pulled by abuses. Somehow you got, God's got to cut you loose and set you free. You got to see that God's going to do something new and great in your life. Yes. Amen. Let's lift our hands right now and worship him. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I know the Lord is in this place to do a work in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You're here. You're here. You feel like you're being held back. You're, you're pulling against the restraints. The world's, the world's spirits are conspiring to, to keep you from going forward, to keep you from growing, keep you from having vision, to keep you where you are. Hallelujah. Yeah, but, this, but, I, but they didn't receive the Holy Ghost in the church that I grew up in. Who cares? What are you going to do about you now? Are you going to allow yourself to be controlled by... Folks, what they believed or didn't believe 50 or 100 years ago, or are you going to follow what God is telling you, that you can be filled with the yeah. baptism of the Holy Ghost yeah. right now, today? Yeah. Your life can be absolutely transformed Amen. by the presence of God. When I came to Pentecost, I was told, you were born a Catholic. Born a what? I didn't. I didn't think priests could even make babies, let alone have them. No, that's your religion at birth. What, 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 if I would have allowed that to control me, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be a tongue talker. I wouldn't be filled with the joy of the Lord. I wouldn't have joy unspeakable and full of glory. No, I really wasn't born a Catholic. I was born in a Catholic family. But God took me on a journey. Hallelujah. And that is to find what my soul 
was hungering for. Let's pray right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I release people from chains that hold them bound to traditions and ideologies and concepts that are robbing them of the glory. Anything that robs someone of the glory in the name of Jesus, let the glory of the latter be greater than that of the former in the mighty name of Jesus. Does anybody want more? If you're satisfied, I guess you can go on. You know, church is over. But if you want more, I want you to come stand up in the front here. I want more. I, this, isn't the end of, this isn't the end of the line for me. No, I want more of God. <sighs> Hallelujah. I want more power. I want more authority in the Spirit. Oh, Holy Ghost power. There's room for everybody that wants more more of God, more of God.